I want to give you something this morning that I think is um, extremely cohesive with kind of what we've been doing in our message messages over the course of the last few weeks uh, leading up to um, this new decade, a new year, new challenges, new changes for us. And I wanted to give you a question this morning that would kind of launch us into my thoughts and kind of seal today, kind of book in today for us those, uh, those things that I think are paramount in, in kind of a resolve and kind of an absolution in our life going into 2020 and beyond. These three things, I'm going to give you three things in just a few moments, and I believe that if you will in, instill these three things, you will embrace these three things, they will become a daily factor for you in your life. It will change the direction, it'll change the course of your life. But I want to ask you a question, who's the richest person that you know? I want you to think about it, I want you to think about it, who's the richest person that you know, here, here on earth, not spiritually, all that, who's, who's the richest person that you know that lives on this earth, all right? Everybody got it in your mind? You got your rich person? You know what's interesting is most everyone in here just a few moments ago in the asking of this question defined the word rich around money. That's how we defined it. Okay. In other words, what you just read isn't who's the richest person you know. What you read was, who do I know who has the most money? That's what I want us to embark upon this morning. When we think of the word rich, we seem to always associate it with finances. But how many of you know throughout scripture and throughout our life, there can be extremely rich individuals that don't have financial substance? And we get those confused sometimes. We, we misconstrue that. I want to show us some powerful principles and some tools this morning that'll do that. But before I do that, I want to show you how your Lord and Savior refers to his riches, what God's rich about, what, what our Lord and Savior is rich about. And I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Everybody this morning, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I want to, I want to read right out of the Word of God where it gives declaration about God's riches and what, what He is rich in and what He is rich in for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Ephesians 5, chapter 2, verse 4 says this, But because of His great fo- love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, the God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even When we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. We need a big amen just in that right there. How many remember last week about grace and peace? How many are thankful even though we didn't deserve it, God still gave it? It's by his grace we are saved, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us. Listen to this. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 7. We're going to talk about riches again. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Verse 10. For we are God's handiwork. Turn to the person next to you and go, you're pretty handy, you're pretty handy, you're pretty handy. You're pretty handy, okay? For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. How many know what we're supposed to do? Good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's preordained, it's predestined. Those things that God desires for us and in us, he predestined for those to take place. Jesus said in Matthew 5, he gave us what he referred to, and if you know these these chapters, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, this is the greatest sermon that was ever presented to any congregation. This is Jesus' dissertation that we have entitled the Sermon on the Mount. He was on the mountain, that's why it gets that subtitling. And gets that overview. Jesus said these at the beginning of Matthew 5. Things that we wouldn't correlate as riches. He said, those who are poor and humble are rich. Although the word we use to translate it is blessed. 
Jesus says, those who pursue justice are rich and blessed. Those who are merciful, those who are pure, those who work for peace or who are persecuted, all, all are rich and blessed. Jesus defined these characters as spiritual currency. This is what gives value. This is what gives volume to a person at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So his list is this, they're, they're up here for you. Number one, poor and humble, pursue justice, merciful, pure, work for peace, and those that are persecuted. These are all characteristics of those who are rich in Christ. Not necessarily, there's not one application due to volume or substance or finances in Jesus's list. Matter of fact, most of the list already grieves us because we don't want to do any of that. That's not something that we refer to even so in, in social circles. Hey, you're poor and humble. You're so rich. That's like kind of, where'd you get that? You know, hey, you're being persecuted. Man, you're just filthy rich. Way to go. Keep it up. So all of those things, this is where we get misunderstandings in the word of God to what is substance and what is valuable in godly things and what is substance and valuable in ours. Matter of fact, in that same ser- sermon, and you've heard this said many times, Matthew 6, Jesus gives us the whole application of all of the principles that he teaches in these three chapters. And, and I, I think he kind of gives the overlay of this with this verse, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you, but seek first the kingdom. What Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount are kingdom principles, kingdom currency, those things that in our earthly realm may, we may not constitute as wealth or constitute as blessing or constitute as riches, but they're paramount in the eyes of God and the things that Jesus presented to us. So I, I have another question for you this morning. Everybody look up here for just a few minutes. Have you ever asked God what was stopping or blocking your blessings or riches from him? Have you ever had one of those, one of those moments where, where you felt like things in life were ganging up on you? Things in life weren't adding up. You weren't in the time frame. You weren't in the timetable. How many of you know all of us have these timetables in our lives where, where we have planned out certain things that need to happen? For instance, when we're 16, we need to get our driver's license. 18 or 19, we need to graduate from high school. Um, Somewhere around 22 to 23, we need to graduate from in between there, we need to get married. Somewhere shortly after that, we have to have our first kid and then our second kid and then maybe our third kid. and, And by then we've got a basketball team or whatever you've decided in your life. But we all have these, these ideals of this is the time frame. This is my layout. This is my plan. This is what will make me fulfilled. This is what will bless me. This is what will give me value. This is what will give me riches, that I'll have a beautiful marriage, that I'll have a wonderful spouse, that I'll have perfectly obedient kids that always do as they're told, that I'll, that I'll, what's wrong with all of you rich people? And so what ends up happening in the matter of, um, of this question, have you ever asked God what's stopping or blocking your riches or blessings? The reason that you start to ask that is in the time frame and the timetable of your life, things that you had thought, things that you had planned, things that you had desired, things that you had positioned yourself for didn't work out and it couldn't obviously be your fault. Therefore, God's got to be, God's got to be punishing you. God's got to be withholding from you. God's got to be restricting somehow in you. And so you hear a message about blessings or riches or things of that magnitude and instantaneously you get grieved because because things within your life, things that have transpired in your life, when you look in the rear view mirror, I love what Pastor Jimmy proclaimed a few moments ago as we launched into worship and I believe that that led us in the direction of, of exaltation at the end that it's time to look at the windshield of our life and not the rear view mirror. But so often the rear view mirror subjugates us and restricts us and constricts us to looking in the windshield because we feel we, feel we haven't been positioned. We feel God hasn't given us his riches and his blessings. So we ask things like, God, why, why aren't you moving on my behalf? Why aren't you doing my plan? Why, why isn't this working out? God, did you forget me down here? Anybody ever in the privacy or the secrecy of some place, your home, your bathroom, your prayer closet, your, uh, your car, look up at God at one point and go, hey, have you forgotten me? I'm here. 
Hello? Hello, I just wanted to let you know I'm still here, God. You see, the Bible says, as a believer, God has already blessed us. When, when you've received God, you've already walked into God's blessings, and he's already got a plan to partner with you on those blessings. So if God has already blessed us, and it's already been predetermined those blessings, it, it may be something we need to evaluate and line up with in his word, in our prayer life, and in these principles in order for us to understand and receive them succinctly like he planned for us to have them. So this morning, here, here's, here's a thought. What can we do to receive the blessing and riches God has intended for us And what are those things that we need to be on guard about that may be quenching or restricting those riches and blessings? Here's the three things that I want to give you. Here's the first one. The first one that we need to walk in, the first one that we need to embrace in 2020 and going into this next decade, and I would say for the rest of our life, in order to not have our our blessings and our riches restricted, we need to be the people of God that know how to take authority. Everybody say take authority. Here's the problem. So often when we think of riches or blessings, we figure out how to do it in our authority. How many of you have ever noticed when you take authority over your life, you end up creating more of a mess than just letting God do it? Anybody out there besides me? Four people. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're here this morning. We're going to have a wonderful time. You have to take authority. And a lot of times we think that's, okay, how do I partner with God in taking authority over things? It's not your authority in the first place. It's always been and always will be God's authority and partnering with that and releasing that in your life. How can we as individual followers of Jesus change the world and take authority over our blessings. How how can we release that? How can we partner with God, take authority? God, whatever's restricting my blessing, whatever's restricting those riches from me, how can I take authority for those so that I can experience your favor, I can experience your mercy, I can experience your touch, I can experience your power? We have to be about doing God's stuff, God's way. Everybody say that. God's stuff, God's, one more time. God's stuff, God's way. When the people of God show up to do God's stuff, God's way, then God shows up in power and might to line us up with the authority he's already partnered for us to have. A lot of times people think they can take authority, but the problem is they take authority when it's too late and they're already devoid of any power source within them to be able to do it. For instance, someone gets sick in the family, then you decide to fast and pray. Then you decide to come to prayer meeting. Then you decide that you're gonna show back up to church. Then you decide that you're gonna do this. I wanna share something with you. There is a spiritual bank that gives you authority in the spiritual realm. And as much as you have to make a withdrawal, you also have to make deposits. That was really good. How many of you really believe that? I've gotta make a deposit I got to make a deposit. Now, you may, you know, preachers get that messed up and say, well, that's in, that's in a church attendance and that's in your participation and that's in how hard you work. And how many of you know that's really low on the scale? The best thing that you can do to make a deposit in the bank of riches and blessings for God is to continue to grow in your relationship with him. It's a relationship thing. It's not, a, it's not just the works thing. See, a lot of times we think works is an itemized list. The good works that Jesus is talking about that I gave you in Ephesians is partnering with his power, is partnering with his authority, is partnering with his love, is partnering with his mercy. Whew. You see, our mission is to change the world we live in. You have the riches and power to shine the light of Jesus in the darkest places in your world. If we will see who God views as rich and blessed and take authority over what he's already planned and provided for us, we can walk in his blessings every day. How do you, how do you take authority? Anything that's contrary to the word of God, you've got power and authority over. Okay? So if there's anything coming against you, any, any thoughts, I mean, no, it says take your mind captive. This is what, this is all this teaching is in the same application of taking authority. You have to take authority over your mind. You have to take authority over your actions in order for the riches and blessings of God to be partnered in your life. It's very obvious that every blessing has the potential. Listen to this. Every blessing that you get has the potential to bless you and bless somebody else. Do you realize so often we we think that we partner with blessings with God in order for them to fulfill us? 
Most of the blessings that God wants to give in your life is so that they can be displayed for his glory, his power, his authority, and his anointing so others can see what God's doing in you so they can have some of that. That was really good. It's very obvious that every blessing has the potential to bless both the gift, the giver, and the receiver. When we bless, we start thinking positive and good thoughts. When we bless, when, when we decide that we're going to get blessed and we're going to be rich, that's why those things are itemized. When you're pure, when you're merciful, when things like that, all of a sudden you start being a blessing. When you start taking a second seat in order to give somebody a first seat, God notices the position. And in our mind, it's like, I keep getting run over. And in God's mind, he's like, oh no, you're not getting run over. You actually have a spiritual first seat, but in society, it looks like a second seat. So let me show you what I can do with that, with my glory and power coming out of you and through you. You start taking authority. It doesn't look like the earth. It doesn't look like society. It doesn't look like in where we live in now. It's impossible, listen to this, it's impossible to be used in the resources of a blessing and think negatively about somebody. Have you ever thought of that? Man, I just want to bless somebody. I just want to bless somebody. But Lord, let me bless people I already like. (laughs) You're going to have a problem taking authority with situations and circumstances in your life if you think you get to subjugate and pick who God wants you to be a blessing to. Matter of fact, he says stuff like, love your, love those that despitefully, how many know I'm just quoting scripture. All of a sudden, what God views as love, what God views as a blessing, what God views as a partner with, already clashes with our human existence. Father, I have no problem blessing others for you. I just want to make sure I liked them first. Because you obviously don't want me to bless people I can't stand. And Lord, I'm a Christian, so it's really hard for me to even admit that. Although you and I know we have conversations in our mind about them all the time. (laughs) This is just real, real, real and raw this morning, amen? See, these are things that you take authority over in order to be rich and blessed. So you have to change the venue in which you decide to bless. Lord, let me bless my enemies. Let me bless those that despitefully use me. Let me bless those that gossip against me. Let me bless those people that may not be in my line of sight that I desire to be a blessing to in order to walk in your blessings and release. How many know the more that you bless the way God wants, the more blessings are released in your life? How many want blessings from God? This is how you take authority over those blessings that are stifled and restricted from you. Look, look, what, look what Peter says. I love Peter. The whole book of Peter. Matter of fact, both books of Peter. You ought to study that. If you want a place to start studying the word of God, start in Peter. This is what 1 Peter 3 says. Having compassion on... How many, let's go back. How many of you want to be rich and blessed in God? Amen. Just wave at me. Kind of go, hey, I'd like to be rich and blessed. Okay. So we've gone through this application of taking authority. And this is how we take authority. We get in alignment with what God wants to have authority over, not necessarily what we want to have authority over. So this is what it says, 1 Peter 3, 8, 9. Having compassion on one another, loving the brothers. Everybody say tenderhearted. And then what's that next word? How many many know there's a lot of verses on friendly as a resource for blessing? If you want to have friends, you must show yourself. I mean, no, that's another scripture. So those of you that are dealing with loneliness, everyone hear me that's in that boat and feel like you've been robbed or cheated. Those of you that are dealing with loneliness, those of you that are dealing with messed up relationships, this is something you need to partner with right here. If you want to have friends, you better step up to the plate and start the process. That's taking authority in your life. Pastor Jim, I would love to, but I'm so socially awkward, and every time that I do that, people just seem to stomp all over me. Keep trying. Sooner or later, you'll find the right people. Never give back. Here's how you take authority. Never give back. I had someone last week. They, uh, they... They sent this communication to me. It was kind of interesting. Pastor Jim, I really, really this morning learned a lot about grace. 
stuff I didn't know, especially with the illustration that you gave with Pastor Jimmy and Jamie, but I just wanted to say to you, due to my nationality, I would shoot them first and then ask the Lord to raise them from the dead. That was my response. <laughs> Those of you that weren't here last week, you don't know why we're all laughing, so I urge you to go watch last week. But in the, in the context of that thought, how many of you know you, you can't give back evil for evil? You, we spend too much time trying to justify. We don't have authority because we sin, spend too much time trying to platform ourselves and trying to keep things even. Never give back evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But look at this. This is what it says. But on the contrary, I love Peter. Giving what? Knowing that you were called to do this so that you might. So you do all of that and you give people a blessing. And guess what Peter says you get in return? You get to in inherit a blessing. You see, our job is to look for and invite God's blessings through us so we can touch others for him. I want to read that again. Our job is to look for and invite God's blessings through us so we can touch others for him. We have to take authority over thoughts and actions that would contradict the opportunity to be the salt and the light for Christ to a hurting in a dark world. So I want to, I want to give you this, undertake authority. If you have felt lately that something was blocking your blessing or was blocking you from being a blessing to others, then it's time for you to take authority. And how you take authority is what we did just a few moments ago, impromptu. Do you realize that at the name of Jesus, demons tremble? That's, that's the word. At the name of Jesus, things shift in your life. At the name of Jesus, just try it. Every time you get a negative thought, every time you get positioned wrong, every time you get treated wrong, every time something happens in your life, every time you get a bad report, you start taking authority in the name of Jesus and you watch how the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace within you. Just in the name of Jesus. Just in the partnership of the name of Jesus. If, if, if it's not in the word, if it's not in the word and you know it's not from God, then don't allow the enemy to continue to have control over you. In the name of Jesus, I take authority that's been given in that name, the name above everything. I can't change anything, but his name can change everything. By the power in the name of Jesus and by the power that he paid for and gave you on the cross and through his blood. There used to be something my, my parents have recently moved here, and this is something that I got from my mom, and I want to tell you something. This next generation better get it. This next generation better get it. My generation, the millennials, the X's, the Z's, the TB's, the FG's, the whatever comes next. We better get it. We better know how to take authority in the name of Jesus, and we better know how to plead the blood. Because it's the blood that shifts stuff. Pastor Jim, I don't know how to plead the blood. You need to do some studies on how to do that. I'm not going to spend some time on preaching with that. You start pleading the blood over the situation and, and the circumstances of your life. You start pleading the blood over your family and your children. And you watch how the enemy has to step back. You watch it. You watch it. You watch it. First thing this morning that I want to give you in the new decade, in this new year, is take, a, take authority. The second thing, and this is a big one. Be consistent. First of all, take, take authority. You, you know we live in a, in a society that makes excuses for every inconsistency we could fathomly come up with and then we medicate it. Love you, live stream. We do. If there's one thing that will help each of us to become the man or woman God wants, rich in blessings, it'll be found in consistency. Inconsistency always open do opens doorways. Inconsistencies always open deceptions. Inconsistent. I'm not talking about everybody around you. Pastor Jim, I could be consistent if everybody else around me would do it first. Have you discovered that's never going to happen? Because they got their junk in their own trunk. So if you're waiting for something else to align for you to get consistent, you're finding excuses and loopholes. Whew. Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher, once said this. Listen to his quote. 
A person's life is always more forcible than their speech. A person's life, the consistency of their life, is always more forcible than their speech. When men take stock of him, they reckon his deeds as dollars and his words as pennies. Your deeds are dollars, your words are pennies. If his life and doctrine disagree, the mass of onlookers accept his practice and reject his preaching. You see, what we say to one another matters, but what we do for each other matters that much more. Being consistent. It's so much easier to believe in a person who lives out his or her life with consistency and honor than someone who speaks of both and does neither. I want to read that again. You've got to get it. It's so much easier to believe in a person who lives out his or her life with consistency and honor than someone who speaks of both and does neither. We want them to love and cherish us each and every day. How many, how many know we want our spouses to be consistent with, well, let, let me do this. How many of you, how many of you have a job? Just raise your hand if you have a job. Not a trick question, you have a job. Okay. What if you showed up tomorrow and said, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time with some of the rules around here and some of the expectations that you have on this job. So I just wanted to let you know that there are 52 weeks out of the year. I get two or three weeks vacation and I want to have two or three weeks floaters where I can show up whenever I want to. And I can do my job when I feel like it. And you go ahead and pay me. So we're just gonna start that this year. And if I don't show up, just know it's one of those moments that you and I have agreed upon contractually that I feel like I deserve to be inconsistent with what we've decided here on my job. Anybody own a business here? Raise your hand. Stacy Hawthorne, what would happen with your employees if they came and played, let's make a deal like that? They wouldn't last. Okay. So there's one that we do every day and we don't even think of. So here's another one. We get married, we fall in love. And after we fall in love, about a week or so after, matter of fact, it's the last day of our honeymoon. Our spouse sits down and says, you know, I just want to tell you that I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be loyal to you for 51 weeks out of the year. I think this is fair. But I I need you to understand that there are some inconsistencies sometimes that I fall into, some entrapment, some stuff. You know, there's other people I think that are cute. And and so uh, for for a week, a year, you know, I'll let you know what week it is. Because I want to be fair to you. That that we just, we just, we're still married, but we just don't have to act like it. and And it's no big deal. Everything's fine. You see, every one of us in here are doing the same thing, but how can we do that with God? God, I want your blessings. God, I want your riches. God, I want your love. God, I want your support. God, I want your healing. God, I want your connection. But I want it when... And the rest of the time, I just want to party. I want to do what I want to do. I want to live the way I want to live. I want to be where I want to be. I want to go where I want to go. I want to spend my money on what I want to spend my money on. And we should be fine, because you're a God of mercy, and you're a God of grace. If you want to be rich and you want to be blessed, you got to take authority and you got to be consistent. Consistency plays a very large role in our daily lives. But did you know that it can drastically affect our spiritual life as well? When you're inconsistent with your walk with God, sooner or later, you're going to begin to question your purpose. And this will bring on situations and circumstances that will create conflict and hardships. Listen to this. Spiritual consistency causes a buffer that makes the enemy's ploys and plans against us harder to come about. The more consistent you are with the things of God, the less the enemy can rob, steal, kill, and destroy from you. Here's the third one. First one, take authority. Second one, be consistent. And the third one, don't, don't let disappointments dwell. So 
I'd like everyone this morning just to look up here for a few seconds. What are you disappointed about? I want you to think about it for a few moments. I'm going to do a little little understanding about it in just a few moments, a little teaching about it in, in just a few moments, but I want you to think about what those things are that's disappointed you recently. Maybe it's a disappointment that's been hanging on to you like a hanging chad for a long time. And you're hoping it'll go away. You're hoping that you can fast enough, you can pray enough, but for whatever reason, it just seems to still be visible and it seems to still have application and impact for you. What are you the most disappointed with and in? Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your financial status. Maybe it's some relationship issue. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's Maybe it's your children. But what are you the most disappointed with? Let, let me give you this. The problem is when you have unmet expectations that give you value and worth, when those expectations aren't met, aren't met they create a disappointment that dwells. It hangs on you. One of the things that I wanted to do was during this part of the message, I wanted to shackle myself to, to one of those, you know, Big round, you got what I'm saying, kind of a, and I'd say ball and chain, but some of you refer to your spouse, so I don't want to do that. <laughs> but see, you hope everybody sees this, but, but for whatever reason, I, I want to give you this. Understand this. Understand, whatever you're most disappointed with points to something that you've put your hope in. Whatever you're most disappointed with or in points to something that you've put your hope in. You see, instead of putting our hope in things of eternal value, in things in the heavenly realm, we've put our hope in things in the earthly realm, and we wonder why we keep getting defeated and disappointed by people, places, and things. Instead of putting our hope in things of eternal value, we put our hope in things that don't satisfy and that feed our pride. And when it doesn't work out, we live with this disappointment and despair. We wear it and people can see it. Do you know you wear disappointment? You wear it. People can see it. People can see it that don't even know you from an aisle away. Wow, there's something heavy on that person. And it usually wraps back to a disappointment in an unfelt or, un- or an area of pride. Mm. You see, disappointment, it steals the riches of God's blessings from our lives and it steals it from our countenance. It causes us to second guess and react and live out our lives in resentment and frustrations. There are some disappointments. I, I want you to think about this. How many of you know that there may be some disappointments that's happened in your life in order to realign you with God. Have you ever thought that disappointments may be God's way of reminding us that there are idols in our lives we need to deal with? I was talking with someone, I was talking with someone about two weeks ago. And, uh, and this can happen in any area. I'm going to go through, through some of them. But this person is a mega hunter. And they've been known as being a hunter that's extremely successful, you know, animals just come and kind of lay down and sacrifice before them. And, <laughs> and, and you may not, all of, all of you in here that don't understand that life, that's, that's fine, just bear with me, but, but this person was unsuccessful this year and it has caused their countenance. It has caused their success. It has caused what rejuvenates them and gives them status to be decreased. And because they weren't successful, they're questioning whether or not God loves them. Now, everybody that doesn't hunt go, oh, that's absolutely ridiculous. I'm going to pick on yours in a minute, so be careful. (laughs) Because all of a sudden, all of a sudden you can know when something's become idolatry in your life. 
by how disappointments are dwelling and clouding and reigning over you. It could be hunting. It could be work. Disappointments at work. Disappointments with where you thought you would be in business. Disappointments with where you thought you'd be up the totem pole and where all of those kind of things. Here's, here's this disappointment that raised down on you that I've been doing the same thing. I've stayed faithful. I've stayed consistent. I've taken authority. Pastor Jim, I pulled in the parking lot and in the name of Jesus, I have done all the other stuff. Anybody with me today? You don't know how many times I have pled the blood over all of those Oh. <laughs> and I've been consistent. I haven't taken a sick day in four years. And God knows there were days I was sick of it. <laughs> but you walk into work, and when you walk into work, you wear your disappointment. It comes out. You're not changing the world for the Lord. You're not changing the world for yourself. Because all of a sudden work has become an idol in your life. And your work and the issue and the status of your work now has a spot where... Sports. Yeah, that's right. S-P-O-R-T-S. Are you with me, Jordan? Good, buddy. Sports. If Frisco doesn't win today, there it is. If San Francisco don't win today, pastor, there goes my marriage. I promise you they're taking two absent days from work in order to, oh my goodness gracious. People around the Eugene area, when the Ducks football team loses, it's already gloomy there. They just add to it with their countenance. (laughs) It's a sports game. Pastor, I prayed. Let me enlighten you. He doesn't care about sports. (laughs) Pastor, I disagree with you. He cares about everything that we delight our heart in. Do you realize there's a whole bunch of mess going on in the world that's going to take precedence over whether San Francisco wins or not? Whether you fasted and prayed for two days, David? (laughs) Now, when we hear it like that, all of a sudden we're like, yeah, you're right. But you know, pastor, all of a sudden, when your sports team loses, your kids are like, they they text mom. (laughs) We're not going to be coming over for a while. And sometimes they text dad. You women are, but yeah, yeah, come on. Just wanted to let you know, is she bad? Oh, she's really bad this time. Because we wear that disappointment over something. Over family. You know the greatest disappointment many times in our life? is our family. Pastor, if all of my kids would just do what I want to and serve God with all their heart, mind, and soul, I'd be perfectly fine. We'll join the crowd. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for our family, but if all of a sudden the disappointment in our family starts to indwell upon our countenance, then we're partnering with the lie of the enemy instead of partnering with the life of God. With the countenance of God. Have have we been speaking blessings over them or have we been aiding and abetting the curses around them? Pastor Jim, I don't know why, but I don't know why, but they never call. I just would like them to call once in a while. (laughs) Have you ever noticed? That they don't call because when they call, you start guilting them about something or guilting them why they haven't stopped by? Why aren't they in church? church? Exactly! (laughs) I just wanted you to know I missed you there on Sunday. I saw that you were. Just just wanted to remind you that the house of God's always open for you, sugar. (laughs) 
I'll always love you, but sometimes your choices disappoint me. <laughs> this is some good stuff. And then their variance or their degree of God comes out of the disappointment that they see on you about them. Because you've allowed a disappointment to dwell. Disappointments about, about money. Disappointments about sex. Disappointments about... We get disappointed about so many things and then we wear it. And then we punish. And then we wonder why we're not rich and we're not blessed. I, I want everybody, I'm almost finished. If you want to know what you're the most disappointed about, I'll give you the answer to that question with another question. Here's, I'm going to give you a, the answer to the question with a question. If, you, if you're wondering, does disappointment dwell in my life, you can answer that by what you complain about the most. I guarantee you, if I were to pull the people around you that are closest to you, they could tell me what you're disappointed in. Because of what you do to complain about what you're disappointed in. You see, from within, from within the heart, the how many know that scripture? From within your heart, your What you complain about often and frequently has a way of revealing something that you've put your hope in. Something that has replaced God and His action in it in some way, in some area in your life. Because over time when disappointment dwells, it'll start in the natural and then it'll go into the spiritual. When you've prayed for your kids and grandkids for years and years and years and you've fasted and you've taken authority and you've pled the blood and you've shown them a consistent Christian lifestyle and they continue to do and act and live the way that they're doing and acting, pretty soon no longer is your soul frustration with them, but you can't help. Pastor Jimmy just said it a few moments ago. Sooner or later you get frustrated and aggravated and you start repositioning yourself with God. And then you don't have any authority left. And then you don't have any consistency left. And then the disappointment and the depression and the despair gets heavier and heavier and heavier. Whew. You see, what we complain about often reveals what really has power over us and what is restricting and disappointing us. I know many people that are disappointed in the government. They're disappointed in politics. They're disappointment. I know many people that are disappointed in the state of Oregon. That's why we have bumper stickers. Jefferson, state of Jefferson. That's going to save all our problems. Let's cut Oregon in half. Cut Northern California in half. Come together and all the Republicans unite. Yeehaw. I like it. I'll slogan it. I'll even have you sign the petition. If you got stated Jefferson in your front yard, fine. But I want to share something with you. It's amazing how we partner with earthly things and we wonder why heavenly things grow dim. And they started out as good things. And now all of a sudden, disappointments and frustrations, they partnered us with people and places. And we wonder why we're not blessed and we wonder why we're not rich and we wonder why we're not having life and having it more abundantly. And we don't have authority and we've fallen inconsistent and our life wavers to and fro. And we seem to be disappointed and discouraged and depressed. And we're trying to get our hormones balanced and we're trying to get our thoughts balanced and we're, we're trying to, we're watching Dr. Phil religiously like we've never watched Dr. Phil to get our answer. Come on. It's in the church just like it's in your neighborhood. And then we complain about it and we fester this spirit. 
We fester this spirit. I've often wondered, and, and it was illustrated for us by, by Pastor Dan Muller more than anything, that whole context of the other side of Jesus leading up to the cross. Does anybody remember that? Does anybody remember when Pastor Dan started talking not like Jesus? And we were all sitting there going, this whole thing grieves us because Jesus wouldn't talk like that. If Jesus lives in you, you better stop it too. Pastor, I was going to come to church today. We were going to have a lot of fun. We're still having fun, but I want to share with you that if Jesus dwells in you, you've got to extricate some things that aren't of him in order to be rich and blessed. Listen to this. Let the riches of God be what is manifested from your life in this next decade and coming year. Take authority over those things that are not God's will and his purpose for your life. Be consistent in everything you do for the Lord and don't allow yourself to be tossed to and fro. If you've set a course for your spiritual future, then fight for it. Everybody hear what I said. If you've set a course for your spiritual future, fight for it. Fight for it. I'm going to read my Bible every single day. Fight for it. I'm going to pray for this amount of time every single day. I'm going to do this devotional every single day. I'm going to be in church at least this amount of time every single week. Fight for it. Fight for it. Be consistent and fight for it. Lay up for yourself treasures in, not on. And don't let disappointments dwell in your life. Disappointments are going to come. But how you choose to face them and respond to them will be a large factor in receiving the blessings and riches that God desires to to bestow upon you in the future. This morning, I believe if we would focus ourselves on these three powerful principles and ideas and make them a discipline in our lives, it will cause each and every one of us to be the richest people that other people know. So I want to ask you again, who's the richest person that you know? After this message, after this message, who's the richest person you know? I, I, I bet I have an idea. I bet I, have, I bet I have an idea that it's a person that knows how to take authority. You, you know it. That richest person in your mind, they know how to take authority and they're consistent. They're consistent. You can count on it. And they don't wear disappointments. They don't let disappointments dwell. Things can turn negative into their life. Things can turn upside down in their life. They can have loss in their life. And for whatever reason, they just seem to be like the Energizer Bunny. Ding, 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 ding. They just keep going and going and going. And if you were to think about it now, you'd go, man, man, that person is one of the richest people. One of the richest people I've ever met. I want to pray over you today. And I just want to ask you today, if you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Jim, there's some things in my life that I need to change There are some things that I need to rearrange. There are some things that you delivered this morning that I've been dealing with that I need to take authority over, that I need to get more consistent in. And that I don't don't want to any longer have disappointments dwell in my life. You You know what those things are. You know individually the process and the application of this message today for you and your life personally. But I... I want to ask you today. I want to ask you today to ask the Lord to help you walk in His riches and His blessings and His glory. I'm going to pray a blessing over you, a priestly blessing today, but if you're here and you would say, Pastor Jim, one of those things today really resonated with my heart and I, I need to get it realigned. I need to get it changed. I don't want there to be restrictions or blockades 
anymore for what God can do through me and in me. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand to to the Lord. Not to me, just to the Lord. Just raise it real high. Raise it real high. Say, that's me. I need to settle it today. I need to settle it today. I need to settle it today. Father, I thank you and I, I bless your people today. I bless your people to be to be poor and humble. <laughs> I bless them to be merciful. I bless them to be pure. I bless them to be sound in spirit, Father. I bless them today in their persecution. Father, I pray today for your touch, that the riches of your glory will be manifested in eternal things in heavenly realms and not in earthly things in earthly realms. Father, I bless your people today like they have never been blessed. Lord, those things that they need to adjust, those things that they need to realign, those things that they need to partner with in order to let your power and your glory and your authority to take authority this morning, to be consistent and to say said fast like they never have before. Lord, to not let disappointments dwell, not let disappointments come out of them and off of them. Father, I pray today that the riches of your glory will be resident in their lives so that people can see it, people at work, people in the store, family members, children, grandchildren can see the riches of your glory being manifested upon your people. I thank you today. You are a great God. You are a holy God. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, high five two people around you and say, you're rich, you're rich, you're rich.